Hey everybody, uh, my name is Luke Fisher and I'm a second year PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography studying um, deep sea extremophilic research as well as uh, astrobiology. Um, I went to University of Connecticut. At, I went to the main flagship campus stores and I also went to um, Avery Point, which is the um, satellite marine science campus for University of Connecticut. I went there for my undergrad um, I graduated in 2019, and I immediately started my PhD program um, after that. And uh, my major there was um, marine sciences, and I went into I went into the marine sciences initially from high school when I was starting the um, the National Ocean Science Bowl team, which is essentially a quiz bowl quiz bowl style um, competition where we would compete against me and my team would com compete against other states and essentially your classic judge reading the question you all have your buzzers quiz style but it's all focused on oceanography um, I really got my interest in marine biology and oceanography just by the sheer amount of really just unknown um, there is so little known about the ocean as a whole um, even though it makes up the vast majority of our planet and there's just to me, there's, it's just kind of like this next frontier of science to really dive into the ocean. And, you know, I think we can learn a lot from it that we're not really giving it credit for. Um, and while I was at UConn, I think the, not specifically the really the courses helped me, but I really um, did a, I did a good job and I really made it a priority to reach out to graduate students and faculty to try to get a, um, a research career, just like, actually getting my hands on some real research as soon as possible. And I started doing research my freshman year um, as a result of like reaching out to TAs and um, faculty and staff at University of Connecticut. And I think that the courses that um, that helped me were just the, I would honestly say that the general biology courses, general chemistry courses, organic chemistry courses um, would have, I didn't take some of those, but I think it would have been very beneficial and I would definitely recommend um, anybody who's going into marine sciences to uh, obviously if you can take some marine science courses and you want to just do that as your major that's fine that's great um, but I will say that if you are really gung-ho and you're really set on pursuing academia specifically PhD program or master's program um, I would say that you can you really can't go wrong like you can really go into any field of marine science. So if you're more interested in the biology side, you can definitely go into a biology major and then, or if you're interested in physiology or chemistry, there's no real requirement that you need to do some sort of marine science background to get into a marine science uh, graduate program. For example, most of, my, most of my friends have never taken a marine science class in their life prior to coming to Scripps. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I work at Scripps. I'm a second year PhD student and uh, Scripps is right in La Jolla in San Diego. And my, my subfield that I work with marine biology is mostly pertaining to marine microbiology, specifically focusing on deep sea extremophiles in hypersaline anoxic um, high pressure environments on the bottom of the ocean, uh, as well as astrobiology so really thinking about those extreme environments and how we can use those to kind of um, as I like to think of them as windows to these other extraterrestrial bodies to essentially help teach us what we can learn from earth to employ that elsewhere um, specifically with a big focus um, NASA has a really big focus on like life detection so the aspect of what experiments can we set up on earth and send them across into space to basically detect life and find strong evidence for life or uh, evidence that there is no life. Um, and my main responsibilities are, there's a lot of responsibilities as a PhD student, I'll say. Um, it can really differ between your advisor and um, what kind of program you're in. Uh, my specific, uh, my responsibility is really just maintaining my cultures. That's a lot of my work, maintaining the cultures, basically coming into lab almost every day to um, assess how they're doing, because a lot of things with biology are very time sensitive. You know, you can't just let things sit on your on your bench for a um, very long period of time. Um, but also just responsibilities in terms of like mentoring. There's a lot of mentoring opportunities and you'll just kind of get thrown into the midst of it, whether it's TAing or helping out an RU student or just someone who wants to come into the lab and use some of the equipment. 
and then as well as a lot of a lot of meetings um <laughs> there's a lot of uh paper deadlines especially right now um but it's hard to really pinpoint the responsibilities. You really have a lot of responsibilities, I would say, as a PhD student. Um, I know for master's students, it's still a very high level of responsibility, but um, the sheer length of time between a master's student and a PhD student, the I would say that a lot of the, the weight really goes to the PhD student. Um, but it can just be really anything from just some, I know that some PhD students just take classes they don't even worry about the research while other ones are taking classes, worrying about the research, writing papers, mentoring students, managing the lab. It's it can really it can really differ depending on your major and who you're working with. Uh, and the projects I'm working on currently mostly pertain to hypersaline environments. So uh, salt works, for example. So uh, salt work is essentially a or a solar salt harvesting facility is where especially we, we have one in. Uh, Southern California and Chula Vista, basically seawater's pumped in and uh, to like these massive, uh, huge, like I'd say like acre long or like acre wide tracks of like these ponds essentially. So you can think of these massive ponds or lakes that are just filled with salt water and the job of these solar f harvesting facilities, they basically move and pump this water in these really, really expansive areas and then near the end of this um, evaporative stage, you start precipitating out your salts. So you precipitate out your sodium chloride, which is your halite, um, which is used like sold as road salt. I don't think it's food grade salt that we have here, but anyway, um, and then also magnesium chloride also sold as road salt and, um, and uh, other industrial applications. And they essentially harvest that. But since it's this insanely huge environment and it's really dynamic, you get some really interesting biology so you're you're getting these really deathly uh, what are called chaotropic brines um, that are arguably some of the most hostile environments for earth there's no life that's actually been shown to um there's no active life that's ever been proven to survive in these brines these really what i call chaotropic brines or magnesium chloride brines um, and basically my specific project works on assessing life in these brines um, and trying to find ways to measure this chaotropic effect, which can be really, really tedious and really ambiguous. It's very difficult to pinpoint that. Um, and also just doing large scale genomic work. A lot of, a lot of the work in microbiology right now um, with like the explosion of genomics and omics approaches, that's a lot of like the focus of pretty much all microbiology research, I would say, at least in kind of the envi environmental microbiology section. Um, but I also work on evolution experiments where that we that would be called adaptive laboratory evolution experiments where or a directed evolution where you start with your specific microbial strain, you expose it to a stressor and you propagate it and you transfer it. And over time, that microbe will hopefully um, develop mutations and evolve to that stressor. And then from there, you can do fancy resequencing analyses to basically determine what genes have changed in this genome of this microbe. And then from there, you can do some really cool genetics work to basically prove if you found something um, worthy that has allowed the microbe to survive within your given stressor. So um, with my work specifically, as I mentioned, with these magnesium chloride or chaotropic brines, no one really knows how um, how life even though I said they're sterile, there's still environments where there's really high amounts of magnesium chloride, but um, that life can still pervade, but really no one knows how these adaptations occur. So it's basically just trying to get this theoretical limit of life and trying to find how far can we push it and like what are the microbes doing basically um, to survive in those areas. Um, and then another thing I'm doing, again, like all PhD students are very different with their research directions and really comes down to funding a lot of the times. Um, but another project I'm doing, which is a totally different tangent, is essentially working on um, green fluorescent proteins, GFPs. And this was actually, th these proteins were discovered from this, uh, I think it was a jellyfish. I can't remember the name of the jellyfish, but it was a species of jellyfish. And um, researchers were able to basically use this protein to tag certain um, certain cells or tags, certain cellular processes or organs or functions. It's kind of like 
when you see the pictures of like these glowing pigs and stuff, essentially researchers have like tagged these mice or like the pigs or whatever they are with this green fluorescent protein. So essentially this work is using these green, for, green fluorescent proteins to tag very specific enzymes and regions of messenger RNA within this extreme high pressure environment to basically see how microbes are adapting to high pressure because there's, again, there's also evidence that there's life in the really high pressure environments equivalent to um, you know, like 10,000 meters below sea level. That's about 100 megapascals, which you can think of as like, I think it's somewhere in the order of magnitude of like 51 elephants standing on like a square inch. So really high, high pressure, crazy environments. And my, my advisor's research mostly focuses on life at high pressure. So he got funding for this project to essentially analyze using this really cool microscopy technique to look at proteins and cells in situ in real time, looking at their responses to high pressure and using this green fluorescent protein as a way to visualize what's happening in the cell. So it's basically kind of getting these really, really fine detailed microscopic snapshots, snapshots of exactly like what the cellular machinery is doing because you can really think of the cell just as this insanely complex biological machine and we're just trying to find that little part of what's going on that allows the cells to survive at these um at these pressures and kind of in terms of uh the big goals for astrobiology is really just to develop methods that you can you know send off to space you can send off to nasa and they can use these life detection approaches to hopefully elucidate if there's life or not in these proposed briny environments there's evidence for subglacial lakes on mars as well as um, on europa and Celadus. there's potential um, these briny oceans underneath this thick layer of ice so there's basically the astrobiologist like uh creed i guess is follow the water so the one of the only things on earth the only well, one true life determinant of what we know about life is that it needs water so if you follow that water hopefully you'll find you'll find life it's like a great starting point basically um and unfortunately my daily activities used to be great you know it used to be coming into lab and you'd interact with colleagues and your advisor and you'd have you know you'd see your friends go get coffee talk about your research um the daily activities have really changed it's uh, quite unfortunate but it's currently right now it's mostly just zoom meetings with colleagues and it's a lot of uh a lot of writing right now because right now i'm trying to finish a deadline so right now it's just kind of like the daily grind is just write 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 and then go to meetings uh and then check up on the cultures make sure everything's doing okay and the uh, the short-term goals are really to just finish this paper um finish up some experiments whereas like the long-term goals are really to try to just get into um you know, get into some really big projects, like really pioneer something for the dissertation work, and then hopefully move on to a different position in academia, or maybe something interesting at NASA or JPL, uh, which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or um, yeah, just some some other industry job that I can really get deeper into the science. And I guess uh, for, for everybody else here, I, I guess, you know, for the target audience, I know a lot of that is just like, probably gone way above your heads because it's just again you get really i guess the advice is that you get extremely specific when you get into like the graduate level work it becomes to a point of just like you know you're you know you're becoming like an expert in this tiny like pinhead within the field like it's just it's um extremely deep knowledge that is um like infinitely specific it's just like every phd student you talk to um they're doing something, even if they're all in climate science, they're all in marine biology, it's just all of their research goes into crazy different directions. And even people that are within my lab, we all do completely different research. So um, it just really gets specific and it really, um, you really have to dive into the knowledge. So it's just, it, it gets very deep essentially. And I guess um, entering in, like for, for students entering into marine biology, I would say, uh, if your goal is to go into academia and go into like a master's program or a PhD program with a marine biology focus, I would say do not be afraid in undergrad to pursue um, uh, a field of, of, you know, of a specific science like chemistry, bio, um, biochemistry, 
Um, I'm not sure if I said physics already or even engineering. It's just like, since oceanography is such a massive field, there's basically a need for every single type of scientist, like completely, like, you know, there's lots of physicists here, you know, that are doing you know, like satellite work. So I guess the advice would be, don't think you have to just, you don't have to go to a marine science undergrad program if you want to do marine sciences in the future. Um, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's sometimes it could be better to actually get a more specific education and then apply that to marine science. Um, and I guess that kind of gets to a point of saying like, that was probably my biggest mistake where I was finding out again, because when I went into undergrad, I really wanted to go to a PhD program or a master's program. That was kind of my goal. I just thought, I, I just saw undergrad as like a step to get there. Really. It wasn't, it wasn't as, um, important as the graduate options for me. And I think the mistakes would basically be to um, pursue those more specific sciences because it's, I would say it's a lot more applicable. Um, and the other thing that I think was probably the biggest mistake was to really, really start learning a programming language like this second. I, I think that's, I can't stress that enough, but if I could go back, I would have just started doing like Python or R or just MATLAB, anything, any programming language in high school and just worked on it from there. Cause it really is like a language. It's like, you know, learning a second language, you know, you gotta just really practice it. And it is immensely helpful. Like once you get to the graduate level work, when you have to process data and you have to write, you have to make figures and present your data, you know, you, no more Excel basically. Like you, know, you kind of have to throw Excel out the window, even though how, you know, it's easy and nice. Um, it's it's almost i would say it's almost like a prerequisite for grad like you obviously can get in and like people understanding a lot of people haven't had any coding experience but it is definitely um definitely down the line an essential task that i think everyone should really know what to do um how to how to code and also just in terms of figure generation like how to make really nice figures on uh different programs um and i think uh my contact information is out there. So if anyone has any more questions, just feel free to, to email me. I'm happy to go into more detail. Thanks.